Right, if you could hold any questions for just now, we're just going to go straight on to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Erba, Erika Wimbush, who's Head of Evaluation at NHS Health Scotland, who'll be talking about policy evaluation in the public health. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you, Louise, for, for setting the um, context for my presentation, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to follow on from what Louise has said because the context that Louise describes is very much the context that we work in um, within Health Scotland. So what I'm going to do is follow on from that in terms of setting out some examples, hopefully, about uh, from pu public health policy evaluation uh, in relation to how our evaluation practice has changed over the last four or five years in the, in, in the context that Louise has been talking about. For those of you who don't know Health Scotland, um, we're the National Agency um, for Health Improvement in Scotland, uh, a special health board at the national level, and we work very much as a sort of intermediary body between with the Scottish Government in relation to the formulation, development and evaluation of policy, with local health boards and their partners at local level in terms of implementing policy, and also with the um, public health health improvement workforce in terms of improving practice. Um, we have evaluation is a very important part of that role, um, both in terms of we conduct commission and coordinate evaluations, we support others to plan um, and evaluate their programmes, and we help identify and embed learning from current evaluations and past evaluations into today's policies. Um, as an outline, my, what I'd like to talk about is, first of all, um, a bit of attention to this big question of effectiveness. Um, it's a really important question for lots of people. It's an important question to ask, but it's really tricky to answer. So I'll briefly look at some of those reasons, and then I'll go into three examples of um, some of the work we've done. But unfortunately, Louise, I'm not going to talk about it equally well. I really just don't have time. Um, so, starting off... Um, the first thing I want to say is that addressing the question of effectiveness is certainly um, very important, but it's not the only question we address in evaluation. Um, I like Eleanor Chelimsky's definition of the three broad purposes of evaluation because they, they make you look at who's asking the question. First of all, evaluations for development reasons. These are quite often um, self-evaluations, which Stephen Marwick will be talking about more this afternoon, and they help managers s strengthen the development of their service or their program with a view to improving performance and capacity. Now, here the question of effectiveness is addressed, but it's quite often addressed in terms of are we achieving our objectives or increasing the outcomes, and are we reaching our clientele effectively? And the voice of the user is really important in those evaluations. If we're dealing with evaluations for accountability purposes, they're mainly for funders or sponsors of a program, and their questions around effectiveness are often twinned with the ones around um, efficiency and cost effectiveness and well, as well, because they're really trying to make it to inform decision making about future spend. Um, evaluations for the purpose of knowledge building, again, really important, quite often done by the academic sector and through research grant funding, and they're often looking at a better explication and understanding of causality between an intervention and the possible outcomes. Um, I think that classification, so effectiveness is something that's integral to all those three purposes, but the question is addressed differently according to who wants to know. And it's also the level of evidence and the detail of the evidence varies according to who's asking as well. So while for accountability purposes, a decision maker might just want a credible performance story, a, a, an academic dealing with the knowledge building area will want to be able to publish in a peer-reviewed journal and re will require a really different standard of evidence. Secondly, um, on the question of effectiveness, it's quite often posed in that rather stark term of does it work? Um, now some of the problems with answering that question are in terms of what's it? You know, do we actually understand what the programme is? How does it work? 
Is it one thing or is it multidimensional? Is there agreement about the program amongst the stakeholders? Um, what are the key variations in design and how it's, how it's rolled out locally? And that's the territory of program theory, which I will come back to in a minute. Um, the other question is, um, for whom does it work? Um, the question of differential impact, because we do know that nothing works for everyone. Um, so that question of understanding variations in how individuals may respond to and engage with a program and therefore differences in terms of who's being reached is really important in terms of inequalities. Um, in what circumstances does it work is another important thing to understand because we know that nothing works everywhere in the same way. There are really important differences in terms of understanding socio-economic context, institutional context, economic context, political context, etc. Especially in terms of understanding transferability from one context, working in one context to working in another. And of course there's all the unintended effects. Um, it, it, we might ask the question, does it work in terms of the things we intended, but what about some of those things that were unintended? And some of the um, other causal mechanisms that we might not have thought of originally, um, which might produce those intended outcomes rather than the program itself. So it really is a much more complicated question to answer than the, the, that does it work question. And then of course there's the, always the question of methods. Um, in terms of answering qu of the question of effectiveness, research designs that will demonstrate causality and the attribution of observed outcomes to the particular program. Now, this hierarchy that I've put there in terms of designs uh, to assess causality and attribution, you're probably all very familiar with. I don't need to go through them. But what what happens is that quite often um, academic researchers are often highly critical of the quality of evaluation research that carried out in practice settings uh, when it comes to assessing the question of effectiveness. Because in practice settings, we're much more likely to use simple before-after um, designs and case studies. Um, and the reason for that, there are several reasons for that, and quite often it's because robust control designs are often very difficult to implement in real world implement, um, implementation settings for several reasons. Partly there's a resistance to program, designing program implementation around evaluation purposes. For example, designing implementation so that you could randomize to an intervention and control group a lot of program managers wouldn't really entertain that. Um, there's a strong culture of localism, so local autonomy over implementation. So from an evaluation point of view, you want to see consistency in how a program might be um, run across local areas, but actually with a localism agenda, that's really not on the cards. Program planning is very weak in terms of specifying outcomes that make sense in terms of the activities. And often the programs we're evaluating are very complicated or complex. They're not the simple ones that you'll tend to evaluate using randomized control tiles. So for all those reasons, it actually becomes um, quite difficult. But from our perspective as evaluators, um, we do need pragmatic ways to assess effectiveness that are also sufficiently robust and systematic in order to provide a credible picture of impact. So what do we do? And this is where we've increasingly come to use theory-based evaluation to help us in that. Now theory-based evaluation is not a method, it's not a design, it's an approach. It's a way of thinking about the intervention being evaluated and its possible effects um, in terms of that theory of change. Um, these, these are five core principles that have been identified in a recent systematic review of theory-based evaluations. Um, and it's interesting to note that the way that theory-based evaluation is used in practice um, is actually shows that a lot of the time what people do is they develop quite elaborate um, theories of change at the beginning or logic models, 
Um, but they're not so often applied to the evaluation process in terms of formulating questions, planning the design and execution of the evaluation, the measurements you use, and some of the analysis and causal explanation. So that doesn't happen quite as much. And what I'd like to do in, in thinking about the three examples that I'm going to show you is think about is, is to illustrate how we're trying to use um, theory-based evaluation more in our evaluation work around it, addressing questions of effectiveness and providing that story around causality or demonstrating attribution at least. So I'm going to start with Keepwell. Um, Keepwell is Scotland's flagship primary care prevention programme for reducing health inequalities in coronary vascular disease, morbidity and mortality. Now in Scotland we, have, we do have a declining rate in CVD mortality overall, but actually the burden of illness and premature death from CVD is very socially skewed. So there's a strong social gradient there. So this is the way the NHS is trying to, it's a preventive programme and it's trying to reduce health inequalities. Um, it was the area we first tried using logic modelling. <laughs> it's quite interesting going back to look at it now. This is back in 2006. Um, now, I'll show you the logic model that we used, and it's a bit complicated, so you don't have to look at all of it, but it was our first attempt to try and use this as a, for program planning. We developed this logic model at the point at which we were trying to plan, at the time it was called Prevention 2010. Um, and um, the theory of change that's in here is that if you provide additional funding for GP practices in the most deprived areas where there's a high proportion of um, people living with high risk of CVD and if the GP practices are able to identify those high risk individuals and offer them health checks and then prescribe medication, refer them to other preventive services and if they take up those and comply with those then this will result in a reduced CVD risk factor profile and bring down rates of CVD mortality and morbidity in that targeted group and thus reduce health inequalities. That's basically the theory of change there. That is, you can follow that through in that, uh, in that uh, logic model. Um, but, so there's a long chain chain there, made even more complicated by the fact that in this logic model you see there's three levels. There's the level of the local service delivery at GP practice level, but that's dependent on also successful delivery by boards and CHPs in terms of supporting the Keep Well program to get going in GP practices, and at national level organisations like us and ISD and Scottish Government doing our bit in terms of supporting implementation. So there's three different levels at w that are, need to happen before these outcomes here might be expected to happen. So these are the, that's the sort of way that w we initially started using uh, logic models. The first, at the time we commissioned this evaluation, it was a fully commissioned study. We don't really do this much anymore. We commissioned the evaluation of Keepwell in its first phase to University of Glasgow and Edinburgh, and the original proposal included just the Wave 1 pilots of Keepwell, and it was trying to look at effectiveness using individual level patient data. However, this turned out not to be possible. Two main reasons for that. Firstly, there was a reluctance to design the Keep Well program in term implementation for impact evaluation purposes. So, you know, who couldn't do that. Plus, there was a lot of data problems. Firstly, we couldn't, we couldn't negotiate having systematic data co collection across all the health boards. Um, we had difficulties just extracting data that was collected from the GP information systems, technical difficulties. Um, local boards had the right to refuse the release of patient level data, which some of them did. Um, data linkage, difficult. Patient level data couldn't necessarily be linked to some of the outcome data. And there was no follow-up data on the referrals available. That actually spelled, ugh, this is really difficult to get a picture of, of outcomes. So what happened was that what this evaluation team produced at the end of five years was a lot of work 
on thinking about reach and engagement, that early stage of outcomes, which was actually really useful in terms of that stage of implementation. But the, the five years later, the decision makers turned around and said, we've spent five years evaluating, we still don't know about impact. So they come back to us and said, can you try again? Can you try and give us a picture of impact? Um, but in the current climate, it's got to be very resource efficient. And actually, we, don't have, we know that we don't have that patient level data. So what we're trying to do now, this is very much just in the process of discussion, is again using that outcomes chain for keep well much simplified. We are thinking of combining um, outcomes analysis here using routine data that's already collected, what administrative data, as some people call it, um, on these outcomes at this end. Um, but it's all GP practice level, no individual level data. So I'm comparing that between keep well and non-keep well practices, but we need to do some more work on is there a difference between keep well and non-keep well practices? Is the CVD prevention practice similar or different? And also, what is this range of variation at local level? So we need to understand that too. Plus, we've got uh, a qualitative study here which is looking at is it plausible to expect that through, from a patient's perspective, the journey through Keep Well was plausibly linked to behaviour change at the end of the day um, in this particular population. Because if, if, if that's not plausible, then actually the whole pack of cars comes falling down. Um, so anyway, that's, that's what we're doing with Keep Well. Um, still very much one in process. Smoking ban. Everybody's heard about the evaluation of the smoking ban. It's one of those good news stories um, that we all love talking about. Um, but it's very interesting in terms of a, it, it marked quite a big transition in how we did evaluations at Health Scotland. Um, first of all, one of the differences was we worked with the policymakers on the development of, of that intervention in the first place and moved quite smoothly through to then evaluating it and, and collecting baseline data. Now, the smoking ban is one of these lovely examples you don't often get where it's a simple, single intervention that was implemented on one day. So, for, oh my goodness, and five minutes. So in terms of um, before-after comparisons, that was brilliant because we could do quite good clear pre-post measures. Um, there was, we used a theory of change here, not for planning, but for evaluation purposes. And so this, this provided the roadmap for outcomes for the, for, the, for the smoking ban. And the program theory went something like this. The smoking ban legislation, which was introduced primarily to protect the workforce from exposure to secondhand smoke, um, was realized though there's a lot of potential other wider public health benefits. There was a big comms campaign at the start in order to raise awareness, public awareness, the health risks of passive smoking, and thus prepare the public for greater acceptability of the legislation. And we needed effective enforcement of the ban to achieve high levels of compliance. Now, if you got high levels of compliance that would bring reduced population exposure to secondhand smoke um, and reduced opportunities to smoke, that would bring health benefits and cultural changes, such as acceptability of smoking would reduce, and increase pressure on smokers to quit. So that's the sort of, it's quite a simple measure, but that was quite a long tail of what, those, what the um, outcomes might be. The design um, that we carried through is very much, you know, we, a focus on outcome evaluation, looking at those range of outcomes that are on that um, logic model, using routine de data sets to examine trends in those outcomes, um, some primary data collection, um, for, for example, on exposure to um, secondhand smoke in bars, for example, and basically a before and after design with some controls. The evaluation delivery model changed in this study, that where we became, um, Sally Hall within Health Scotland actually coordinated a whole range of studies, a portfolio of studies around the smoking ban, some of which we did in-house, some of work commissioned out, and some were research grant funded. And actually our role became one of coordinating that, those studies to provide a picture of impact. 
um, and feed that back to the policy makers. I want to just quickly say something about one of the questions is well, what do you use as controls? When you've got a national rollout of something like a smoking ban, what do you use as control? Now, this is one of the outcome variables, hospital admissions for acute coronary syndrome. So it's a measure of... Um, morbidity, smoking-related um, illness. Now, what we found there was a 17% drop within the first year of the smoking ban, which was pretty amazing. But could, we ex could, we, could you actually say that that was due to the smoking ban? We needed some comparators. So what we looked at in terms of comparators was, first of all, the underlying trend in morbidity in Scotland through the SMR01 data, where we saw an average of 3% over 10 years, so 70% pretty different to that. Um, deaths in the community, um, which was only 6%, um, and deaths in England pre and post ban, which was only 4%. So it turned out that, yes, there was a much, better, much greater drop than would have been expected. So, um, and then another uh, outcome variable was um, smoking prevalence. Now, this was only a secondary impact of the smoking ban, and what we found here was that um, one year post-ban, it had declined by 1.7%. Was that expected? Or, you know, to what extent was that due to the ban? Now, again, we used international comparators of other countries, how smoking prevalence had changed in other countries post-ban, um, in terms of seeing whether that was the sorts of level of change you could expect. And if it was very much in line with Italy, where smoke-free legislation had been introduced, but it was less than in other countries where um, we'd had the, the, there'd been workplace restrictions. Now, Scotland's alcohol strategy, I'm going to be very brief about this one, is currently in train. It's very much using um, the same approach that we use with the smoking ban. Um, in other words, outcomes analysis using routine data, before and after design, comparisons England, Wales, Northern Ireland, combined with evaluation studies of implementation and the same sort of evaluation delivery model where we're coordinating a series of studies. Um, again, using a theory of change for the evaluation, but this is very different to the smoking ban in that Scotland's alcohol strategy is a multi-component strategy. It has new licensing laws. The, prim the pr primary new things are new licensing laws, the introduction of alcohol brief interventions um, within NHS settings, and then currently it looks like the introduce of minimum unit pricing. So there's, there's not just a single um, piece of legislation on one day. So with the challenge is how do we look at impact across all those um, different interventions um, and quite a wide range here of intermediate outcomes. The main thing we're looking at is reduced alcohol consumption and redu reductions in alcohol-related harm. But there are these intermediate outcomes here um, which are also important. Let me and I just wanted to say one thing about this, and this how we're using the theories of change in analysis. I think um, Louise mentioned the use of contribution analysis, and that's what we're using here. For example, what we're going to have to do is weigh up the evidence for and against the theory of change. Now, um, taking minimum unit pricing of alcohol, the theory of change is um, that you'll, if you increase the price of cheap alcohol, you'll see reductions in the affordability of alcohol, which will lead to reductions in consumption levels, which will reduce to result in reduced alcohol-related harms. But there are alternative explanations for any redu reductions in alcohol consumption and alcohol-related harms, one of which is the economic recession. So we need to factor in how we will assess whether which is having most, most effect. Also, there's some of the unintended effects with the introduction of minimum unit pricing, it's a long process of introducing that legislation. There's a market response already for the alcohol industry in adjusting its strategies in terms of pricing. So there won't be that clear pre-post distinction, probably. Also, consumer adjustment to um, 
changing prices of cheap alcohol might be such that, um, for example, people might still buy, consume the same amount of alcohol but actually make changes in the, how they spend their overall budget. So there's things like this that we need to be alert to in, uh, in thinking about this. Just to sum up, so the last four to five years... Um, as I've tried to illustrate with those three examples, we've seen quite a lot of changes in our evaluation practice. We're having much greater attention to outcomes and to impact evaluation, um, with increasing use of theory-based evaluation in those impact evaluations. And we're spending as much time now on outcome planning, helping people to plan towards outcomes, particularly in partnership, as much of that our time, we have a whole section of people who do that now, as well as people who do evaluations. We're increasingly using routine data sets. It's much more efficient. Um, and it also means that we're having much closer collaboration with our colleagues in the public health observatory um, on evaluations. And there's been a big shift in our evaluation delivery model, moving towards... Um, us having more of a coordination role and there being a sort of mixed economy of commissioned research, in-house research and um, research grant funded research and we will coordinate putting together that picture of change. So thank you. I've probably passed my time. I'm sorry about that. Um, if you want any further information about any of those evaluations, then those are the people to follow up with. <laughs>